The next talk will be by Bill Clark from the University of Colorado at Boulder, and he's going to tell us about <coughs> liquid crystals and um, nano DNA. Well, no, okay, so we changed the. Uh, Actually, it's changed on the, on the online online version. Okay, so it's uh, okay. Well, uh, so we've had uh, kind of a theme of the school has been photo effects, and <coughs> photo response. So uh, this is, uh, <coughs> in that vein. Uh, so I'll talk about uh, an experiment we did on a particular uh, photoresponsive system. Uh, so this uh, system, this photo activity is based on uh, light-induced cis-transisomerization, which I think you've heard about uh, already. So I'm not going to discuss that in any detail. Um, so <clears throat> this is a, uh, well, and uh, so we know that these, uh, <clears throat> this cis transisomerization is, is responsible for a lot of uh, <clears throat> interesting liquid crystal applications in which you can make glassy polymer systems and induce uh, <clears throat> change of shape, or uh, for example, you can induce uh, <clears throat> in a flat, initially flat film, these undulations in, in thickness with uh, crossed uh, laser beams, uh, or you can come, you can <clears throat> take Brewer's experiments on uh, sort of photoactive cilia. Uh, so <clears throat> a lot of uh, experiments for changing the shape of a, of a polymer system. Um, so uh, <coughs> we look have been looking at a uh, molecular monolayer Asian based system that enables us to uh, look in some detail at the <coughs> process of of, uh, of writing and uh, and erasing uh, <clears throat> an azo-based uh, liquid crystal. Um, so the <clears throat> molecule we're looking at is called uh, DMR. So this is made by Dave Walba. Um, <clears throat> so it's a uh, <clears throat> derivative of, of uh, the indicator methyl red. Uh, so that's the structure. So it has this azo core, uh, a short hydrocarbon tail, and then a silane uh, <coughs> group at the end, which is used to chemically bond it to a glass surface. So uh, <coughs> you can make uh, basically what are, what are self assembly monolayers out of, uh, <coughs> of this molecule. Uh, so you get a molecular monolayer on the surface where the, uh, this azo core is uh, <clears throat> actually it's, it's <coughs> this is an atomistic simulation of the <coughs> of the system on a simulated <coughs> glass surface. So the, the core is sort of tilted about 30 degrees away from being just parallel to the surface and uh, <coughs> In these model layers, you get a very dense packing uh, on the surface. Um, okay, so uh, the, the mechanism, I'm sure that's been discussed already, so uh, you shine in polarized light uh, normal to the surface, um, so molecules that uh, are have this orientation uh, absorb. So the absorption dipole for this photo-induced isomerization is basically parallel to the core of this molecule. 
Uh, and so those molecules get excited, they change shape, uh, <clears throat> they settle down, and in doing so, you, you depopulate this orientation on the surface, and so you end up with the molecules tending to be, on average, uh, normal to the instant polarization. So this monolayer becomes anisotropic. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so uh, that's basically the uh, <clears throat> experimental system. And so uh, what we're doing is once you make this anis anisotropic monolayer, then you can measure its biofringence. Uh, now, a uh, molecular monolayer that's uh, a half a nanometer thick doesn't have too much biofringence. Um, so, <coughs> in order to uh, sort of actually do experiments, you need to uh, <coughs> sort of set up to make very to measure very small biofringence, and so. Uh, we have this uh, sort of high extinction pol polarimeter, which has a, basically a red laser beam, which is both <coughs> which uh, is passed through a polarizer, the sample, and an analyzer. Uh, and then we have green beams. So the red beam is the probe, and we have green beams, which are uh, <coughs> are sort of come in at a, a small angle, you know, at almost normal incidence, uh, which are used to write the, the, uh, <clears throat> the monolayer. So we have a, a beam that's, a green beam that's linearly polarized. Uh, <clears throat> so we have, if you look, <clears throat> if you look at the plane of the sample, you have the probe beam as polarizer and the analyzer, uh, <clears throat> and the writing beam is at 45 degrees. So that induces my infringence. Uh, so, this polarimeter has an extinction uh, between cross polar and analyzer of 10 to the minus 10. So, a typical polarized mi microscope has an extinction of like 10 to the minus 3. So, <clears throat> this is very, very high extinction, which enables us to be able to measure very small uh, wire fringes. Um, <clears throat> Okay, and then we can also uh, measure the absorbance of, of this monolayer, uh, and you, you get this kind of typical azo sort of uh, absor absorption spectrum. We're illuminating with argon laser light, so that's at 514 nanometers. Uh, from the absorbance, we can uh, calculate the coverage of the monolayer, and it turns out to be about uh, Seventy percent, and uh, we can also measure from this, this absorption how much fluence we need <clears throat> to have, on average, one absor one photon absorbed per molecule. Okay, so it's here. <coughs> so it's uh, <clears throat> twenty um, twenty millijoules per centimeter squared is one photon absorbed per molecule. So uh, <coughs> you shine an intensity on for a time such that the monolayer is absorbed 20 millijoules per centimeter <coughs> squared. Then <coughs> on average, each molecule would have absorbed one photon. And this quantity, one photon absorbed per molecule, turns out to be uh, <coughs> kind of the key uh, key fluence unit. And that's shown here. So this is this is biofringence of the monolayer <clears throat> as a function of time uh, for different incident intensities <coughs> of the writing. Uh, so <clears throat> the monolayer in, in the, at room temperature in, in, <clears throat> in equilibrium gradually becomes isotropic. We'll see that uh, in the next slide. So after it sits around for a while, it has in, it's isotropic in the plane. It has no biofringence that you, you can measure. Um, 
when you start shining polarized light on it, then it starts becoming birefringent, and the bigger the intensity, the faster that happens. So this shows <coughs> birefringent as a function of time on a linear plot, then on a log-log plot. Then <coughs> if you scale the time axis according to the intensity, that is, if you just plot net energy deposited as a Biofringence is a function of net energy deposited, and all these curves <coughs> tend to overlap. And uh, you can see that at long time, you get a biofringence that's about 0.15, like a typical looking crystal. So we're inducing a two dimensional pneumatic <coughs> order in this model layer. Um, <coughs> and you can see that you get that. <coughs> The, uh, an energy deposited of one photon per molecule, so if each molecule absorbs on average one photon, you get about 30% of the, 30 or 40% of the final biofringence. So <clears throat> just shining light in, polarized light in, such that each, each photon goes, each molecule goes through one of these cycles and gives you a <coughs> substantial amount of of the final order that you get. And after a few a few of these <coughs> units of absorbed energy, if, you know, after a few photons absorbed per molecule, you're getting uh, a substantial part of the, of the eventual uh, <coughs> biofringence. Now you can see that the biofringence sort of goes, you know, after a few of these <clears throat> photons absorbed, you're sort of up in this regime. Uh, if you keep shining this polarized light on, then the biofringence at very, very long times keeps going up, but quite slowly. But <clears throat> it does keep going up. Um, okay, so this is what the writing process of this model layer looks like. So <clears throat> if, you, if you write a model layer, so you start out with uh, <coughs> biofringence of like 0.15. So this is biofringence at a given time divided by the initial biofringence. So this, this starts out at 1. <coughs> so you write the monolayer and then just let it sit and watch it. Uh, <coughs> then, as I said, gradually uh, the biofringence goes away. <coughs> so it becomes like trap. And this shows how, <coughs> how this happens. Um, so what you find is that, um, in this case, over times less than on the order of a second, nothing, there's very little change. But uh, on the order, time of order of like 10 to the fifth or 10 to the sixth seconds, then biofringence is, is, is <coughs> gone down. Uh, quite a bit, in this case by about a factor of 10. Um, so this <coughs> decay, if you look at long time, uh, <coughs> it approaches just being a, a sloping straight line on a log-log plot. So <coughs> this, at long time, this decay is just a power law. It goes as t to the minus some exponent. <coughs> so <coughs> this decay is characterized by three numbers. So the initial value, and then a characteristic time, which <coughs> is where this corner is in time, which is on the order of a second. And then the, the slope of this decay at long time. So, uh, and then of course the, this amplitude is just given by the initial biofringence. So basically there are two numbers that characterize the, the decay, the, <clears throat> the characteristic time and, and the slope. So it qualitatively looks pretty simple. Um, <clears throat> now if we had had an exponential decay uh, on this log log plot, it will look something like this dotted line. So you see that that the this decay dynamic is, is very slow. Uh, <clears throat> even relative to the to this you know, where the, even if we put the corner of the exponential and this curve at the same place, at long time, this decay 
has much more remnant fire fringes than the exponential decay. <clears throat> All right, so uh, so this kind of data we we describe in kind of the typical lipocrystal way. We have in-plane fire fringes, so <clears throat> we're going to think of that as having in-plane nomadic order. Uh, <clears throat> the there's an order parameter that's proportional to, where the biofringent is proportional to this order parameter. Uh, the transmission through the monolayer is proportional to these things squared. So we're, to get biofringent data, we're taking the square root of the transmission. Um, and so we're going to describe this, this relaxation. <clears throat> well, we can't make it exponential. We just showed that. <clears throat> So we're going to consider that we have a, a distribution of, uh, of relaxation times and maybe of a, of a decay function that is a stretched exponential. Although we'll see that in the decay this, this, this exponent alpha drops out. It doesn't, it doesn't affect the decay process, it only affects the writing process. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so we're going to have some distribution of relaxation times and then uh, of relaxed characteristic relaxation times in a, in a, uh, in a decay function. I'm losing some of my slides here, but okay. Uh, all right, so uh, Now we're going to think of this, <clears throat> this distribution of relaxation times as coming from a distribution <coughs> of barriers. Okay. So uh, for a typical uh, barrier limited relaxation process, we have uh, a, a trial time. So you imagine that these molecules are, are kind of confined by their neighbors. They're Thermal fluctuations makes them try to, to reorient. Uh, so there's some rate at which they make trials. But they encounter a barrier, and they can only overcome this barrier according to uh, a, uh, a Maxwell-Boltzmann factor. So uh, the, the rate or the time it takes to, to overcome a barrier is this trial time, and then times this exponential that's governed by the height of the barrier. So <clears throat> if you, for example, okay, so then we're gonna, and we're gonna imagine that we have a distribution of, of barriers. So the simplest case is that the distribution is a delta function. So you have just a certain barrier height. You have uh, then an exponential decay that is governed by a time and this time is, <clears throat> is controlled by, by the height of the barrier. So uh, <clears throat> in, in this case, there's, there's a barrier gap. So there are no barriers smaller than a certain minimum. So that's what's necessary to get, to have nothing happen for uh, <clears throat> some interval of time. And then, uh, in the case that we have a single barrier height, we end up with an exponential relaxation with a time that's governed by the, the size of this gap. So, uh, we'll have a, a, an exponential relaxation of time tau, e to the minus t over tau. So that's this thing, where tau is the the trial time times this exponential factor that gets larger as the barrier gets higher. <clears throat> so where this corner is is a measure of how big the barrier is and, and what the what the trial time is. Okay. <clears throat> now in the experiments, as I showed earlier, we don't have exponential relaxation. We have this power law relaxation. So <clears throat> um, that means that we don't have just a simple delta function and a single barrier height. We have some distribution of barrier height. It turns out that a power law decay <coughs> comes from a, a distribution of barriers that looks like, looks like this. There's a barrier gap. 
Uh, and then there's a, a, a tail on, on, the, on the distribution of, 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 of barrier heights that's exponential. Um, now, in this, in, if you have a distribution of barrier heights, then you can think of what happens as follows. So, uh, if we have a barrier gap of energy U, then we have to wait until this, this time tau for the relaxation to occur. So, <clears throat> for each energy in, in a distribution of barrier heights, we can associate a time when those barriers, if you're waiting, those, where, where those barriers will be overcome. So, uh, the time for a, a, an energy U is e to the U over kT times the trial time. So this is the time in the relaxation process when the barriers of energy U will be overcome. So as you wait, you start out <coughs> The lower energy barriers become overcome first, and as you go out in time, the energy <coughs> height of the barriers is, it gets larger, larger and larger. We have to wait longer and longer. Um, now, if you have this exponential tail, if you get out here to some point in this tail, the average barriers height beyond where you've already relaxed that have yet to be relaxed. That, that, <coughs> They're on average always the, this characteristic energy in the exponential above where you already are. And so that leads to this self-similar power law decay in the, in the order at long time. So the data can indicate pretty clearly that the system has this exponential distribution of, of barrier lines. Okay, so um, now, so this distribution, it has two characteristic, two numbers describe it. One is the width of this barrier gap, and then the other is the, this is decay constant and the exponential. <coughs> and, and so, then that's scaled against kT. So we have two numbers. This, Um, or I could call it a temperature, Tm divided by the temperature, actual, actual temperature, and then this <coughs> in, in the barrier gap. Okay, so <coughs> for our relaxation data, this slope turns out to be, the power law slope to, turns out to be 0.35, and the power law slope <coughs> is is one of these numbers. It's the temperature divided by the the, the width of this exponential <coughs> tail on the barrier height distribution. Uh, <coughs> so from from this relaxation, we can measure the the, the Tm. So it turns out to be 160 kelvin. So that's the <coughs> that's the width of this this exponential tail on the barrier height distribution. Um, and the, uh, the, the corner, is, as I said, is about, is about one second. Okay. And so this, this, this data is at a particular degree of writing. So here we've written, we've written the film with 12 photon, 12.5 photons per molecule of polarized light. That <coughs> ends, up, ends us up with this, situ this initial model layer, which then <coughs> decays, is, is what you see here. All right, so um, why, <coughs> where does this come from? Where does this kind of distribution come from? Why do we have an exponential tail? In it? Well, uh, <coughs> this is kind of a long story, which I don't have, to, have time to go into, but if you have a random function, <coughs> That's, that's bounded, then the distribution of the extreme values where the, of the maxima and minima are distributed <coughs> according to, uh, I mean, the classical form is called the Gumbel distribution, so <coughs> it looks like this. So it, it's cut off at, at, small, uh, <coughs> at small values exponentially, so that sort of looks like that. 
and then it's exponential at high values. So this sort of distribution comes from, uh, from a, a, a random energy landscape uh, in, a, in a pretty natural way. So it's something that uh, is not unexpected. All right, so if you start out with, with the, the stumble distribution, which is sort of a continuum, continual, continuous mathematical distribution that, that models this, then you can calculate <clears throat> the distribution of relaxation times, and you can calculate the, the relaxation function of the birefringence, which comes out to be extremely simple. It's just 1 over 1 plus t over ta, that's the characteristic time. That determines where the corner is, and then there's this exponent. <clears throat> and at long time, the, the, the stretching exponent alpha drops out, so you basically end up with one <coughs> t plus ta quantity to, to, the, to the exponent. So it's, the relaxation has only two parameters, ta, the relaxation time, and eta, the exponent. <coughs> okay, so, um, so this shows the spinning function here. The gentle line, which <coughs> works really well. Uh, and so we can determine tall and eta from the data. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so, uh, so we have this system of molecules laying on the surface, which we can get partially oriented, and then we let them go. And it takes <clears throat> a second before you see anything happen, and you get this decay. So how does that compare with other liquid crystal systems. Okay, so um, we can do very similar experiments on freely suspended smectic C films. Okay, so this is a molecular monolayer where uh, we have tilted a, a layer of liquid crystal molecules tilted over, makes a smectic C. Um, <coughs> And what you're looking at here are thermal fluctuations. So you have, we have two places here that, uh, so this is, this is one monolayer in the, in the, uh, see, okay, in the, in the surrounding area. So here are islands. This is a few layers thicker. Uh, so the islands have, have, you know, they impose a plus one singularity and they have companion defects. Okay, so that's, a different story. What I want you to look at is just out here. Out here, you have this tilted smectic <coughs> film thermally fluctuating. Okay, and you can see that um, the scale is about 100 microns, and you can see that if we took, you know, if we go down to a micron, so a small area here, that <coughs> the fluctuations are occurring on something like a video frame. So like. 30th of a second. All right, so that <clears throat> is something you can calculate just from frank elasticity and liquid crystal viscosity. Uh, these fluctuations are governed by a diffusion constant in orientation that is a viscosity divided by a frank energy. Uh, <clears throat> and so you can <clears throat> extract D from, from, uh, from these fluctuations and they it comes out quite what you expect on the basis of just typical <clears throat> liquid crystals. And then you can also cal calculate uh, <clears throat> the, the relaxation. That is, if you oriented all these molecules and then at time zero took the orientation field away, how fast would it take them to, to disorder? Okay. <clears throat> if you did that, then <clears throat> you would get um, You would get a curve that looked like this, a relaxation curve, <clears throat> but this corner would be at 10 to the minus 11 seconds, at 10 picoseconds. So <clears throat> that means that our sort of our DMR monolayer, uh, which relaxes with a characteristic time of a second, has a viscosity that's about 10 to the 11th of a typical typical of the crystal. Okay. So it's an orientational glass. It's a two-dimensional glass. Okay. It's 
so we're looking then at the at this, this is, we're looking at the relaxation of a two-dimensional glass. Um, <clears throat> all right. So this is this is the thermal relaxation. Now we can also erase this system by shining on circularly polarized light. Okay. So when you do that, then you get a curve like this. Looks the same. <clears throat> As, as this one, except that it's got a smaller characteristic time, okay, and it's got a different slope. So these these two curves are the same. This, the, the model layers here were written the same <coughs> with, with the same writing fluence, so the initial conditions are the same. Except in this case, we're shining on circularly polarized light. This excites the molecules in a random way, and so promotes the, you know, the return to being isotropic. Um, but now we have some measure of that, that process. We have two things we can look at, this time and then the slope. All right, so <clears throat> in the thermal relaxation, we, we have a temperature of 300 Kelvin. We can measure this slope. That means we can measure the the, the characteristic energy of this uh, <clears throat> of this exponential tail turns out to be, as I said before, 800 and some odd Kelvin. All right, so we know that that's Tm for this case. In the thermal, in this photorelaxation, we end up with a bigger slope. That means that we know what Tm is, and the slope is T over Tm. So that means that bigger slope means that we must have a higher temperature. So in this photo erasing process, the effect of temperature is about 700 Kelvin. So when you, <clears throat> when you shine light on this, on this monolayer and excite, excite the molecules, then they attack their confinement with an effective temperature that's 700 Kelvin. It's very clear. All right, but then there's the other number that characterizes this relaxation, and that's where the corner is. So it turns out that the corner here, in the photo erasing case, is always at the fluids corresponding to one photon absorbed per molecule. So, well, all right. So this shows a series of data for different right on, so on the right hand set, set of curves here, so these are thermal relaxations for stronger and stronger writing. So as you write more, the slopes go down, it becomes more, <clears throat> the, the tail of this exponential uh, distribution of barrier heights gets pushed to higher energy, <clears throat> uh, and the barrier goes up to something like in this case, 1,200 Kelvin. And you see the same tendency in the, in the here, this, this is the light erased data uh, for, in, for increased writing strength, and you see this sort of same trend. And the ratio of these curves for the corresponding uh, <coughs> writing fluences are always around, uh, are always the same. So the, the, the thermal Temperature effective temperature, or the effective temperature for the light induced erasing is always around 800 Kelvin. <clears throat> All right, so this shows a series of data for <clears throat> increased writing intensity, starting with the thermal, which is sort of in the back, the black one, and then increasing the intensity. And <clears throat> if you um, sort of look at where the, the corners are, you see that the sort of the characteristic times uh, are going down for increased intensity. And uh, the, the diamonds on each curve here show where uh, you can absorb one photon per molecule. So as you get into the, the high intensity regime, you end up with this larger slope that doesn't change, and the corners 
keep going to shorter and shorter times. So you can plot what happens to the corner as a function of, of intensity. Sorry. And so that looks like this. So this is the character, this is the characteristic time in the decay where the corner is as a function of the intensity. <clears throat> so at very low intensity, you just have the thermal value. But then at high intensity, then there's a crossover, and at high intensity, the uh, <clears throat> the corner is always at one photon absorbed per molecule, so that as you increase the intensity, it goes as one over one over the intensity. Um, okay, so this corresponds to right. So the the you go back to to here in uh, the, the this this quantity. Time, this time, the characteristic time that's governing the, the location of the corner is basically proportional to the viscosity. So as this time gets shorter, uh, the viscosity is getting smaller. So basically <clears throat> what we're doing, <clears throat> what, we're do what we have here is a, <clears throat> is a viscosity which is kind of off on the right hand side here. Viscosity going as one over one over the intensity of light. Okay, so in in this writing process, the, the molecule absorbs a photon, it attacks its neighbors with roughly a temperature of 800 Kelvin. So that's one that's <coughs> One result. Now, um, if I go back to the original slide with the distribution, um, okay, so in this case, uh, in the thermal relaxation, the, the relaxation time is one second. So from that, we can and we know the trial time is like the jiggling time for a molecule, it's like 10 picoseconds. So in those two numbers, we, we, we get a measure of, of how big this barrier gap is. That is, how big is the basic confinement barrier of the molecule. <clears throat> we see that, that this tail gets longer and longer the longer we rewrite. So the molecules sit in, in this monolayer sort of locally confined by a minimal barrier, then the more you write, the more neighbors get aligned, uh, the stronger this, the more this exponential part stretches the higher energy. So that's a collective effect. Basically, the, the barrier gap is just the, the confinement effect from the even in the unoriented film, just from the packing of the, of the molecules. Okay, so this, um, if you take the time, one second, then you calculate what this energy is. It turns out to be it's about, about 7,200 Kelvin, okay? So, <clears throat> so this thermal time corresponds to, uh, sorry, 7,500. 7,500 Kelvin. All right, so if the molecules are then the molecules attack this this 7,500 Kelvin barrier with a temperature of 800 Kelvin. From that we can calculate, uh, and the, the 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 time is like once every 10 picoseconds on average. From that we can calculate, um, well, what this what this thermal time should be. And uh, what you find is that, or sorry, what the, <clears throat> from this you can calculate in the photo process, how many photons should I need to overcome the, <clears throat> the barrier gap? So uh, it's basically 
this one over this number, and that's something like 10 to the fourth. Okay, so that means that it should take 10 to the fourth photons per molecule to uh, to overcome this, this basic barrier. But this this data is, is on the line for one photon per molecule. So it's much more efficient than if you really think it, 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 it ought to be. The molecule has 800 Kelvin of energy, the barrier is 7,500 Kelvin, so that should take many trials to, to overcome. But experimentally, every photon which generates a local, this sort of local temperature pulse of 800 Kelvin ex produces an event that exceeds the 7,500 Kelvin barrier. So what this means is that in these events, you are <coughs> inducing a local glass transition, a local melting. And so <coughs> the whole efficiency of this the process of, of writing with, say, azobenzene isomerization uh, <coughs> depends on the the ability of these molecules to produce this local, fairly high temperature pulse. And in addition, this pulse has to produce a local melting such that this barrier ends up being much lower than 800 Kelvin, so that every photon can produce a, a reorientation event. <coughs> Okay, so how much time do I have? Do I have All right, so <clears throat> so how what's the physics of this local 800 Kelvin heating? <coughs> uh, it's pretty interesting. So a photon is 2.4 eV in this case absorbing. Um, so if you have one harmonic mode, that would <coughs> 2.4 AV photon could heat it to 30,000 Kelvin. Um, but if you look at this molecule, it's got 25 atoms um, in the core. Uh, so if you just think about the ones that are actually accessible, there's something like 100 degrees of freedom uh, for this 2.4 EV to be distributed among. Um, in which case you would not get very much heating. So something, something different must happen. Now Claudio Zanotti has simulated the, this isomerization to uh, combine quantum uh, uh, molecular and M MD sort of simulation of the process. And so an absorbed photon ends up uh, producing an electronic transition, but then there's a, a relaxation, and then you end up with, in the ground, ground state electronic manifold, uh, the molecule ends up on, a, in a transition state where it could go either cis or trans. Starting out from trans, it could either go back to trans or go to cis. And in this process, so this is a mechanical process now, molecule starts out here on the surface and basically slides down. So that's a molecular change of shape corresponding to something like, you know, this, this reorientation from being trans to cis. <clears throat> and he's calculated the dynamics of this process both in a vacuum, with the molecule in a vacuum and with the molecule packed uh, <clears throat> in, a, in a solvent. And the solvent slows things down a lot. So in a vacuum, this is one of the angles in the middle here, the vacuum the, is the dash curve. The transition is in a fraction of a picosecond. In a solvent, the, this reorientation is, a, is several, <coughs> many picoseconds. Um, and you can just sort of estimate this very easily from, just imagine you have this kind of mechanical change uh, <clears throat> with, with these objects in a solvent. You have a, a balance of, 
of, of a torrent coming from the, the 2EB over like 60 degrees in orientation and then viscous drag of a, <coughs> of a uh, you know, you can just take a Stokes drag. And you get the same <coughs> estimate, something like 5 to 10 picoseconds for this relaxation. So this relaxation from the transition state to the ground state is so slow that, <coughs> that there's no excitation of any vibrational modes of the molecule. The energy is simply transferred to the solvent. It's the mechanical motion. That's what ends up looking like 800 Kelvin. Okay, so <clears throat> um, that's the end of my story. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for your attention. Yeah, I mean, this model layer, it, 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 it should melt, right? I mean, if we, if we, so we should see a thermal blast transition. We should see this thing evolve from one second to 10, you know, to the situation I showed in the film, so yeah. I think it's not okay. Um, I don't think that's going to happen realistically in an experimental system, but we do that in a computer simulation. And, um, well, I mean, you see, you know, in this exponential tail, you see some evidence already for, for you know, in homogeneity, right, heterogeneity, heter dynamic heterogeneity. Um, but, yeah, I think uh, we probably <coughs> see all this class phenomenology in, in the system. And, uh, you know, we're definitely going to look at it. And then another, another question is, okay, the other thing you want to model with glasses is the idea of um, locally favored structures. So you have some local, locally, um, some locally, local minimum which is going to surpass that. So you can really study some local and find some structures. Do you have any ideas of 
Well, I mean, this, uh, if you look at Sort of see these, you know, they, they, they just really like to kind of. I mean, these molecules are tethered, but the tethers have some, you know, there's a few, you know, like a nanometer sort of stretching that they can do. So they really like to get just next to each other, form these little sort of groups of like four or five that are almost like a smith thing. So yeah, I think that would sort of. Yeah, and I still have claimed that you can see the transition by looking for. So kind of percolating cluster of these sorts of thing of these of these little these locally spatial structures. Well, in this case, you can see them. They look kind of first order. Like. I mean, they're like you know, kind of s severe kind of brain boundaries between these 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 plaquettes. So, but uh, in the simulations, we can see this thing melt, and uh, we just have a character. You know, we're just sort of starting. Out. Thank you so much. Thank you again for a very nice